here. Hello, hello. <laughs> um, so we are in for a treat tonight. Um, again, welcome to um, how to score, uh, how do colleges score on student health needs? <laughs> I was, I just messed up my entire introduction because I was like, this, we're gonna, this is a late night session, so we're going to be talking about sex and drugs. <laughs> just maybe not the way you might think. <laughs> so I'm delighted to be here. Um, teen Vogue obviously is, um, you know, as you can tell, I'm a teen. No, um, it speaks to a younger generation um, of people that are grappling with health needs in a really unique and special way. Um, and so I'm really excited to be moderating this panel and to be really thinking about you know, what, uh, what do colleges need to provide for the health needs of young people right now. And so it is my honor and pleasure to introduce two people that have really worked in this space um, and have really pioneer, uh, like pioneering expertise um, to share with us today. So, to my right is Paula Johnson. She's the president of Wesley College. Um, until 2016, she was the founding executive director of the Connor Center for Women's Health and Gender Biology, chief of the Women's Health Division at Brigham and Women's Hospital, professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and profess professor of epidemiology at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. In her free time, I'm just kidding. <laughs> a cardiologist who advances the well-being of women, she's a member of the American Academy of the Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, and was named one of the top 25 women in higher education and beyond by Diverse Magazine. Ted called her 2013 TED Talk, one of the, 10, the top 10 TED Talks by women. Ooh, so yes. Please welcome Paula Johnson. Thank you. To her right is Dan Porterfield. He is the new president and CEO of the Aspen Institute um, with uh, a career on promoting education equity and poverty prevention. In 2011, he became president of Franklin and Marshall College, where under his tenure, the college tripled the percentage of Pell Grant eligible students and reduced student indebtedness. He was also the senior vice president and English professor at Georgetown University and senior aide to former US Health and Human Services Secretary, Donna Shalala. He's been honored by the Kitt Foundation, I Have a Dream Foundation, and the Posse Foundation, and the Obama White House named him one of 11 champions of change for college opportunity. Welcome. Um, and Dan, you're, um, you know, you became known for a fairly controversial move you made as president, um, where you kind of learned firsthand how students live on campus. Can you tell us about that? Uh, that was actually my senior vice president days at Georgetown, yeah, okay. where um, supported in total partnership with my wife, Karen Hurling, who's an attorney, and a public, public interest attorney, uh, and our three children, uh, Elizabeth Caroline, who's in the audience in the red, and Sarah, we moved from our um, nice little two-bedroom Arlington home into a dormitory of Georgetown University, where we lived for eight years among students and fully immersed in campus life 24-7. Loved it, loved it. Um, so Paula, you have been at Wellesley for two years. And I haven't been living in the dorm. And you haven't? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I was gonna make, I'm like, they're paying you enough to live off campus? <laughs> no, no, it's a requirement. You, yeah. you have to live. It's a exactly. requirement it's to the, the job. Contract. You have to exactly. live in the president's house. Uh, yeah. yes. um, so what have you, in the two years you've been there, what are the major health crises that your students are facing? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's um, and this is something that, that our students at Wellesley are facing, but I know, Dan, you saw the same thing at Franklin and yeah. Marshall. Um, you know, across the country we're seeing very high rates of depression and anxiety. Um, and the mental health issues are really kind of um, front and center. And some of the numbers are just staggering. You know, some of the most recent numbers, 39% of college students are basically saying that if they're experiencing depression severe enough that it's affecting their functioning, or it's over 60% experiencing overwhelming anxiety. And, um, and then, you know, there are also students who come to us with chronic illness. And this is, you know, I, I look at it as the success of medicine in many ways because students who never would have been able to make it to college, whether it's Wellesley or a community college, can now get there. Um, but we aren't really prepared. 
And we're also not prepared for a newer generation with these levels of um, mental health issues. And we have to figure out ways of really addressing this on our campus, in addition to all the other issues we'll discuss today, drinking and, um, and other issues on campus. So just to play devil's advocate, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and you speak to the higher levels of mental health issues, um, you know, and, and we had talked earlier, it could potentially be mental health awareness. Mm -hmm. Why does a college have a responsibility? I mean, you know, historically, when we talk about mental health, it's a personal issue, right? It's like, you yeah. know, go talk to your therapist or talk to your priest, yeah. Yeah. Um, talk to your family. Why, why do you feel that university has a responsibility? Well, you know, it's, it's a good question. I do think there, we've gone through a period of colleges and universities asking themselves that question, and where does their responsibility begin and end? And my feeling is that we are here to educate the next generation of young people. And part of that education is to also ensure that they are as healthy both physically and emotionally that they can be. It is part of the full package. It is what is going to allow them to make a difference in the world. And um, obviously, we're not. Uh, a, we're not a hospital, we're not a healthcare facility, although we have healthcare. But I do strongly believe that it's our responsibility to really address this in a scientific way, understand where we can develop evidence. Right now, the evidence is almost non-existent of ways to approach these issues that are not just about service delivery, but that are about wellness, that are about prevention. I like to always say taking a public health approach. And you know, so I do think it's up to us to navigate the way yeah. forward. Now, yeah. Can I take a shot at that too? So and thank you. It's, it's great. It's great to be with Paula. Um, and uh, my subscription to Teen Vogue expired a while back, <laughs> but I understand it's really been really developed in new ways in order to speak to this generation of young people um, on, the, on the issues that really matter. And thank congratulations! You. Thank it's you. Obviously, very courageous uh, to do that. Uh, we have on our right most of the interns who are working at the Aspen Institute this summer. I put out a tweet the other day that said, my interns are greater than your interns, uh, <laughs> because this is a fantastic group. They're all in college, and so maybe you all will come up with some questions yeah. and some thoughts and reflections uh, as this panel goes on. Yeah. Um, but I think I sort of have two thoughts about this question about what's the, what's the role. The first one is that um, it, it, do you have a conception of, the, of a human being as a whole person, mm -hmm. um, meaning a person who has many talents and backgrounds and gifts, who has a, a, an emotional component, who has an intellectual component, has a family, has a culture, uh, is, a, is a collection of potentialities. Um, if you see a student as a whole person, then you know, as, as Paul was saying, you have to step forward and say, well, well how can I help that person develop wholly and fully? That's one, one thing. But secondly, if you said, well, I just want schools to focus on the classroom. I just want them to learn study skills and research skills and public presentation skills. And then I'd still say, you still have to think at what's enabling great learning and what is blocking great learning. And if you're not addressing the things on students' minds and the challenges that they're facing, then they're not able to progress intellectually the same way. So, so either way. Um, and what I think is really exciting about this generation of kids is that they want to be in partnership with the adults and the educators. It's a positive mentality from the start. Let's do something together. And so the schools like Wellesley or like Franklin and Marshall, we're really able to partner with our students. We haven't figured it all out, nor have they, but we can be a partners together to try to figure it out. Yeah. Um, Paula, you've talked a lot about, you know, on, on to what Dan is speaking to, this idea of community mm -hmm. and creating a community. Um, how do you think about that? And you know, what role does social media play in that? Yeah. Because sometimes it feels like we have a community, but then you put the phone away, and, it, and you may not feel like that anymore. Yeah. Well, you know, as, as Dan said, we've got a lot of young people in the audience, and we're going to want to hear your voices on this. But it's something that we have to really think about and take a step back and understand what is community in the 21st century. It surely isn't, now you're younger than Dan and me, but um, it's surely not what, <laughs> what it was when we were in college. And it's very clear to me, so part of the beauty of what we've been able to do on our campuses is actually to bring this tremendous diversity of students 
to our campuses. So whether it's race and ethnicity, first gen, um, sexual minorities, um, uh, you know, we could go on to the various groups of students. And it's a time in life when our students are developing their multiple identities. So the way you develop community is you know, intersectionally across those identities, within those identities. But then what is that more collective community? What does that mean? And I'm thinking about it, particularly from a residential college perspective. Um, how do we create those communities, particularly when there is the world of social media? And so at Wellesley, this is really one of our major um, undertakings or will be over the next year um, with our new student life um, leadership, but also connecting, as, as Dan said, connecting with our faculty. Because it isn't as though you leave the classroom and, okay, you go from one threshold to another. You're, it's one continuum. Mm -hmm. And so our students will be involved, student life, and our faculty. So we'll be figuring it out. But I, what I, the only thing I'm sure of is that right now, we don't have the answer. Mm -hmm. And you know, with, with that, um, so it, with social media was the question. So I think it's fair to say that social media can be used for good or for ill. There's a lot of good that you see when people are distributing ideas to one another, building community, reinforcing each other's achievements and celebrating them or having you know, fun together in a way that, that helps people connect. There's a lot of power, but there's also a downside. Similarly, um, with like socializing, with alcohol. Okay, so socializing with alcohol is something that people do in this country by the hundreds of million. Um, and someone has to learn how to do that one way or another. There are ways when you can use alcohol while socializing that are fine and there's ways that are dangerous. Stress. We experience stress all the time in our work lives and in our family lives and the balance of them. So uh, stress can, feeling of stress can actually be somewhat, sometimes at a minor level, you regulate it, you learn how it is, it can power you a little bit. But if you don't learn how to deal with stress, mm -hmm. then you know, it's going to cause all kinds of actual health, negative health outcomes. So, and, and, and then things like anxiety and depression, um, very present, very present among, among all of us, among adults and young people of every age. This isn't a, you know, a young person problem or something. Kids are a collection of assets. But we can learn how to regulate our emotional burners. You know? And so that's something that like depression or anxiety can be something that a person experiences that they someday feel as part of their power. Yeah. But, they've, but, they've but they've learned how to regulate it. It's not yeah. just going to happen yeah, without some education. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, Dan, because you're talking about learning how to do that. Yeah. And um, a former colleague of mine who runs a very large program at McLean Hospital, which is one of the big academic psychiatric hospitals in Boston, she's come up with this idea of emotional preparedness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And as we... There's so much focus for our high school students, um, having them check off every box yeah. for yeah. what they need to do to get into college, and particularly a good quality yeah. college. And there is so much stress put on that. And for certain families, not all, um, there's a lot of stress involved with very little attention to their emotional preparedness. Yeah. And her theory, this is Stephanie uh, Pinder Amaker, how do we begin to really think about how we focus on their academic preparedness, but also their emotional preparedness yeah. as they are launching into college? And I think we're gonna have to pick that up. Yeah. So here's a question, um, and I'll answer it too. I wonder, how do you think you developed your emotional preparedness? You know, way, yeah. way back when you yeah. were going through the, some of those same things. I'm sure there were moments, because you're such a high achiever, you must have really put a lot of pressure on yourself. Yeah, but you know, it was different. And I think I failed. Yeah. There were certain things I wasn't good at. I learned how to work with people. Yeah. I learned how to study with people. I learned how to have, we had relationships. Um, there, was, there, was, there was kind of ups and downs. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's a very good question. But I think today, there's far more focus on just purely the academic mm -hmm. preparation. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think, we're, as a society, it is not serving us well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, one thing that I'm excited about, if we sort of look a little bit uh, to promising practices or you know, potential solutions, at my school, Franklin and Marshall College, we completely remade 
our residential system and move from a dorm system to something we call a college house system, mm -hmm. with each, each of five college houses having particular themes and uh, traditions, a faculty member who became the Don, academic and personal advisors in the house, seminars held in the house. Yeah. And um, we were able to find that that created a more, as a norm in the, in the residential experience, especially the first year experience, as a norm, um, gathering up for social events that were like welcoming, mm -hmm. programming that got kids out of their rooms, lots of different kinds of programming. We, each house has its own student government. You're in the government. One's like a republic, and one's an assembly of peers. And like, they're all different, <laughs> but everybody's in, everybody had a little bit of self-governance. And incredibly, Franklin and Marshall College was able to significantly improve the level of uh, risky drinking yeah. mm -hmm. by first-year students through that innovation. It wasn't directly targeted mm -hmm. on drinking, but was about the environment and the ecosystem yeah. within which students experience college. I wouldn't say we're in the, we've crossed the finish line yet. There's things we need yeah. to do, but that was one yeah. promise. Well, statement. I think it's a really good. Um, it's it, one thing that is important in that, and the fact that adults are appropriately engaged yeah. with students. And the more I talk with our students at Wellesley, that engagement with adults is something that is welcomed. Again, to your earlier yeah. point. And there's a way in which that socialization is a real growth experience. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I think that there is really an important, that's an important model of getting adults, not, not in a parental way, but in a how do we navigate in society yeah. with each other as peers, but also with adults. Yeah. We do, the two of us, we share this huge value together of liberal arts education and a residential campus where students and faculty mix it up together. Yeah. Um, and I do think, I really do feel that that's as good a model as ever been invented for yeah. education. Um, so that is correct. Um, and it's interesting because I went to a state school and so yeah. didn't get, it was, like, it was like going to school in a city, yeah. um, the 20,000 students. <laughs> um, and you know, even at that point, um, 20 years ago, binge drinking was a huge problem yeah. on campus. And, I don't remember there being a ton of resources. I'm sure there were efforts. Um, but overall, it was actually a really big problem. Mm -hmm. How are you grappling with this at an all-women's college? And how were you grappling with this? Yeah. At, um, yeah. yeah. So you know, it's interesting. The, the, our, we, we do, there is drinking. To be honest, it's not at the same level as on a co-ed campus. Mm -hmm. um, so there are various events where we know there's going to be heavy drinking. And uh, Marathon Monday, for example, is a big deal at Wellesley. Everyone goes through something called the Screen Tunnel. And it's historic uh, at the school. And we were seeing some of the things that we talk about um, where there's football. So you know, at tailgate parties, yeah. people are preloading and drinking prior to going. We were seeing that prior to the marathon. Um, and we really had to, you know, I'm just giving one example, had to really work on how we not only educated our, our students, but also how we thought about um, providing other opportunities for engagement and active engagement from the morning all the way through the evening. And it was very, very helpful. I mean, we went from, you know, several transports to the hospital to none. So, you know, I think that that's only one event, it's not the culture. We actually deal a little bit more with the drinking that occurs when our students leave the campus. And so we have a lot of education to do around how to think about drinking once you are off campus and also you know, all of the parts about healthy relationships and all of the things you can imagine, sexual assault, et cetera that happen um, much more frequently under the influence. Yeah. So I worked on this both as senior vice president and faculty and residence at Georgetown and then as president at Franklin Marshall College. And um, let me say first that one of the things that Georgetown did that was exciting was that we formed this big group of students, faculty, staff of all different types, alums, to try to get at framing the issue. What framing was it? And students perceived that the school had framed it as, hey, just don't drink till you're 21, period and that the school perceived it as students just want us to look the other way. 
And so that was really causing all kinds of friction. And students were basically at Georgetown um, fighting for the right to party, to quote a song. Um, and you remember, <laughs> From yes. the 90s yes. by the Beastie Boys. <laughs> so we needed to break that. We needed to break that logic. And the administration had to loosen up and be creative and open to more. Without going through all the details, we uh, developed a grant that got some funding to allow faculty to teach facts about drinking in their classes. Um, we liberalized some of the campus drinking policies so that more parties would happen on campus where it was safer. Mm -hmm. um, and we developed a social marketing campaign where we shared with students what the, in things like, you know, in safe settings for them, what the actual statistics were, what the actual risks were, because a lot of kids think everybody's, quote, doing it. Uh, and we had some success. I think Franklin and Marshall had a little more success numerically, sort of in the data, by rebuilding its, re restructuring its house system. We also created Franklin and Marshall, though, a group called Point 08, a student-led group whose focus is to educate peers about safer socializing. Not to say don't drink, but to help them learn some of the ways mm -hmm. to know their limits, or to introduce food and water into parties, or to not have sort of like you know, bedroom doors closed off or something, have to keep the party down in the one area. Um, and now, so what, what I think from those two experiments, basically, is I would go a little further. And my belief, actually, is that the 21 drinking age for beer and wine is outdated. Um, no college president should or can take a, take a position. All your right. interns are cheering right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> they, you, they mean, should you, you need to repeat yeah. what you just yeah. said, yeah. though, that yeah. No, <laughs> yeah, no, no college president can or should take a position on this, but yeah. this is my thought, that, uh, that the 21 drinking age for beer and wine is too high, and that what we should do instead is create a learner's permit framework for beer and wine for 18-year-olds. Uh, like, I guess you're like imagining what it would have been like. Um, but uh, I think then if I could serve legally in my pub on campus, beer and wine, to students who are holding the learner's permit, I could actually have all kinds of ways of you know, doing the educational work of being present, as opposed to hoping that what's happening in pre-gaming and you know, settings where I'm not um, is OK. I could have my campus police there, I could have my, my RAs there, and I could take away the learner's permit yeah. if students broke the rules or drove with any alcohol in their system. Mm -hmm. um, I, we may yet see if the Aspen Institute can't convene a conversation where other people besides presidents get introduced to the conversation, because I don't think it's fair to ask presidents to stand up in front of their student bodies and their legislators and try to propose something this out of the box. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that could actually make a difference. Done well. Done well. Can I just, I mean, one thing that, that Dan, you said that, that is very important, we hear it on our campus, and I know that it's, it exists on others, um, others some of the university campuses near us, which is that as we've shifted the drinking off the campus, social life has gone off the campus. Yeah, exactly. And so you're, you're absolutely right, and we are doing this as well, figuring out ways to bring social life um, back on campus in a way that you don't have to go through a number of hoops in order to do that, to make it easier to convene, to have parties, to basically have fun. Yeah. Um, and we've seen what that does with various clubs, with the Greek life, and how that actually has led to very significant rates of binge drinking and all the behavior that comes with it. See, I think, in the Greek life question, when Greek life on some campuses has something of a monopoly on the social life, right. because they have the settings, they have the music, they have the parties, and you can't have other yeah. parties elsewhere, it actually puts too much pressure on that one group, and it would, it would soften it all a lot if we could let more kids have more parties. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I realize that my context is a little different because I'm out of the role, and also at a women's college, there's different dynamics that you're yeah. probably thinking about. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Dan, I, I do think to your point, um, the rate at which college drinking is an epidemic I do think it is time for us to start thinking about radical solutions, yeah. even if it's in the ideation phase. Um, and I can say that as working with so many young people or hearing from so many young people that either feel pressured to drink and they don't want to or are participating in this activity. Yeah. I mean, the, the numbers are just, uh, they are staggering. staggering. You know, the, the, if you ask college students the last time you drank, you know, what percentage drank over five drinks? Okay, for women, it's, over 50%, and for men, it's over 60, 70%. And if you go up to like seven drinks, it is like 30% for men, and you know, I, I don't remember the number for women, but that, imagine, at one sitting, seven drinks, and for five, you know, we're talking about drunkenness. Yeah, what, what do you think, 
And, and do you think it's because it's illegal? Is that what's causing all the binge drinking? Or do we have any early research or um, data well, on, is it the depression? Is it the anxiety? Is it the pressure to fit in? What do you think? Well, I do think college students have been drinking something alcoholic, whether it was ale or like, you know, mm -hmm. some brew from the Middle Ages for as long as there's been college. <laughs> so, so that's gonna, that's, that's part of growing up. Um, but I think, I'll stretch it a little bit, but I do think that some among us of every age, absolutely of my age, peers of mine, are medicating themselves for depression or anxiety with something might be alcohol, which is legal. It might be some forms of drugs, which aren't. But a lot of people, I think, self-medicate. They may not call it that or know it as that. But I don't know that I think that the drinking levels are dramatically different mm -hmm. from the, over the last 10, 15 years. That's actually why I'd, I'd like to really take a shot at seeing if we could normalize drinking with beer and wine in safer mm -hmm. settings and see if that couldn't actually bring down the numbers. Mm -hmm. Try it out in and, a few and, schools. And there is evidence to support that. That's how yeah. most European countries. Yeah. Well, the applications yeah. of the schools to get approved for the pilot program will go way up, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I think peripheral to this conversation, it's come up a few times now, some of the side effects of not just drinking on campus, mm -hmm. um, but I think another truly a public health e epidemic is the rate at which women are exposed to sexual assault exactly. in the college um, environment. And we are, you know, in the middle of, um, as infamously discussed, a reckoning with the Me Too movement, and more and more women are coming forward, um, and the numbers are even more staggering than we thought. Um, I think the last study I read, it was almost, I think, one in four women um, are potentially exposed to some form of sexual abuse um, in their time in college. Um, and this is something that I have done a lot of research and thinking on, especially as we think about college as a space for development and experimenting and really finding yourself. And we're talking about a large segment of the population that ha is exposed to danger or to potentially be stifled. Mm -hmm. How are you thinking about this issue at Wellesley? How were you thinking yeah. about it? And um, yeah. yeah, well, it is. It's a it's a very significant problem and. You know, the, the rates of um, assault um, and also um, just uh, exposure to um, abusive relationships, intimate partner relationships. And I think that we really have to get back to what is a healthy relationship, and it gets back to that community question. How do we build community, and in that, it might not only be the people you are living with in a women's college, but also what does that mean in terms of building healthy relationships? And we're going to have to really get back to basics, because um, I don't think we've really spent time on it. I don't think that there's time spent at the high school level. Um, and what I love about Dan's model at Franklin and Marshall, there are also ways of modeling those behaviors in a yep. living environment, exactly. yep. which I think is extremely healthy. Um, it's women, but I also want to clarify, it's also sexual minorities mm -hmm. have extraordinarily mm -hmm. high rates mm -hmm. of assault, um, same as women, actually. So this is, it is a, a rampant problem. Um, part of it is the alcohol piece, but there's another component to this that we really have to work on. And then, you know, if we think about, too, some of the other aspects of um, harassment, uh, we just did a, um, a, a panel this morning. We just published a big report on sexual harassment uh, in the academy in STEM. Yeah. And if you look, for example, at um, some of what is going on on university campuses um, with students, for example, medical students experiencing harassment, <coughs> This is a, a, everything from harassment to assault, coercion, big problem in our society, and one that's gonna really require a major culture change. It's not gonna be good enough to just get the quote unquote bad actors. Mm -hmm. It's a cultural problem that we are gonna have to really work on. And there are strategies and ways that we can do that. Yeah, um, I, I'll say two things, but then we can talk more, because you can never cover the whole in one answer. The first is, just as Paul said, there's a lot of different phenomenon that all go into this category of sexual assault or sexual misconduct. And so some of the strategies for addressing depend on which manifestation we're talking about. 
i.e., some of it is about empowering people to develop healthful relationships. Some's about, some is about conversation strategy in an intimate relationship and being able to talk to one another and listen. Some is about social environment and expectations or norms that are prevalent, that especially, I think, make men think that you know, it's fine to like, hook up any way you can. Mm -hmm. That's the game. Um, some of it comes out of the context of, you know, occasionally, like relationship violence. Some is um, sort of like a, the, the people experiencing something that they're not sure they wanted, but they don't know how to describe it, and they come back later to it. Yep. There's so, so many things. So our strategies have to be responsive to all that. That's point one. Now, to make it simple, I'd say, two good messages that we try to emphasize at Franklin and Marshall College that covers a lot of all that is that you have to get consent for sexual behavior and every time and for the progressive steps of it. Right? Yesterday's consent doesn't mean tomorrow's <laughs> consented to. Um, you have to get consent, and the person has to, the people have to have the capacity to give consent. Mm. That's, that's like you've got to boil it down, emphasize with your friends and with your children, your grandchildren, those you care about. You have to receive, give and receive consent, and you have to have the capacity to give mm. both parties capacity. Those two things yeah. cover a lot. Yeah. And the other thing, Dan, is too, to empower those who are around you who oh, well, may be yeah observing behaviors, exactly. you know, kind of the bystander type training, but really think about empowering our students that when they see behaviors, to understand it, to name it, and to know either potentially how to intervene in the moment, but how to get help. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and this, is, this is evolving. You're, you all, you're helping to bring about the evolutions. When I lived on Georgetown's campus as faculty and residents, there were any number of times when I was out late at night and I saw kids drunk or heard them drunk in the, in the dormitory, and sometimes there were students I knew. And every now and then I said to myself, what's my role here? I'm, I'm the educator, but I didn't have a vocabulary at that time called bystander intervention. That's only emerged. Yeah. And I'm only now myself learning, maybe you all know some good things, but for instance, at FNM, one of the ways we work on bystander intervention is that we get kids to agree to it before the party. Mm -hmm. But there's even like a co card system where you know I can give you the card. Like the designated driver. Exactly. We yeah. learned it. We all yeah. we all learned it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, if you see me behaving in a way that I've agreed in a moment of sobriety is not how I'm going to behave, or if your friend is in a position where your friend doesn't know how to negotiate herself out of the circumstance she's in, how do we empower you to step in? And one way is to get agreement ahead of time that you'll step in mm -hmm. at those moments and you give me the card. And I, back, yeah. I go back. Yeah. yeah, and early research about bystander yeah. inter intervention is extremely promising. Yeah, exactly. um, it really in is. terms of and, and, and I do think this speaks to the culture change piece. And um, you know, to those of you that may not have heard of it, it uh, was very popular a couple of years ago when Joe Biden um, made a, a, a big campaign called It's On Us about yeah. the role yeah. that men play in, yeah. in bystander intervention. And, yeah. and it really is about you know, how a lot of people, most people actually, when they see something yeah. bad happening, they do want to do something. Yeah. Yeah. They just feel intimidated, uh, yeah. or they don't know the right things to say. Yeah. And so a lot of these programs teach people, OK, so you want to say something. What should you say in that moment? Yeah. I thought that uh, Vice President Biden and President Obama overall made a very, very smart and good move in changing the standards and having Title IX interpreted so that now colleges have to demonstrate that we have in place a whole set of procedures um, that are more or less standardized across schools for um, when a notification must be made, if you know of something, for the follow-up, the timeliness of the follow-up, for uh, empowering the claimant. There may have been a sexual assault with the choice making about how to proceed, for the holding of hearings with panels that are trained and don't include students or coaches, to the nature of the sanctioning and the reporting afterwards, and we're getting there as a, as a country, in my opinion. Every single school, and I won't exempt myself, felt, has felt uncomfortable about the process of trying to reach the standards because it's new work fast, but I actually believe across the board that we have a better, uni more uniform set of practices in place 
around the country, and I can feel more reassured that most schools are reaching or have reached a reasonable standard. There's more work to do, but we've made a lot of progress. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that resonates with you or not as a, as a health leader who's yeah, thought about it. No, I think we, we absolutely have made, we have absolutely made progress. And, you know, look, Title IX, Title VII are absolutely critical um, for us, and they've provided the floor for us to now interpret. Um, but we do have a lot of work to do just in terms of the more legalistic approach as opposed to really understanding the data and understanding what is it that the targets yeah. of either harassment or of assault need for them to get to the point mm -hmm. of potentially reporting. So there, this is a work in progress, but the good news is I think that we are, we are getting there. And we all recognize that we have a tremendous responsibility. Yeah. Um, could, could I ask you too, as, a, as the leader of one of the greatest colleges in the country, it happens to be a women's yeah. college, um, I have this intuitive sense that uh, th there's an environment where emphasizing women's empowerment, yeah. women's aspirations, women's, a women's control of their bodies and their lives can happen in a single sex educational context for some people that's very empowering and perhaps very yeah. promising for how they might negotiate these, these things later in their lives. Yeah. But uh, what, how do you think about that? No, it, it has, Dan, and thank you for that. It has, you know, a, a women's campus is fundamentally different. Um, just if you think about um, not only our students, but also our faculty. Our faculty are 52% women. So in the most male-dominated fields, our faculty are at least half yeah, women. Yeah. And that sets up just a dynamic in general, it sets up a very different um, norm. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so the norms are different, and therefore the sense of self that develops. You talk to most Wellesley women, and they will talk about it was the place where I found my voice. Yeah. It was the place where I evolved, where I understood what I could do. Now, that, not that that doesn't occur across all other yeah. campuses, but I think there's something very different about the way it happens and the agency with, uh, with which our students um, gain those voices yeah. and confidence. Sometimes I feel, looking at a, a school that has gone from being probably 70% male 15 years ago, maybe maybe 65% to now 56% women, sometimes I feel that the males on the campus are not yet really stepping up at the level of aspiration and difference making and sort of societal um, roles they hope to play. And that there's a tendency, and, and please, you know, I, I, uh, this is not all people, I just wonder what, what some of the men in the audience think, a tendency for some men to be retreating into like a bro culture mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's like sort of safe from the threat of engagement that, that maybe class brings or that simply being outnumbered by high achieving women can bring. And I think that's got to be dressed. I think men like me have to try our best to be in dialogue with younger men um, so that we can together think about how can you work, if you're in a co-educational life, your life is co-ed, so how can you work in a relationship with women in order to bring out your strengths and their strengths together? And I do see that retreat a little bit. I really do. Some of fraternity life is about a retreat. Into like, and sometimes it becomes like a hyper maleness of retreat. Like we, we know we're men because we're all men being men right now. Yeah. Um, I'd like to try to, you know, continue to work on that. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the other things that I've been hearing um, a lot is that the, the concern that the, one of the unintended consequences of Me Too, of the Me Too movement, will be that there will be a retreat from being willing to engage with women, that in many ways men might not or be more hesitant to hire women. Yeah. Now, you know, I don't know that if that's fact, fiction, but we have to be very clear that discrimination is not an exactly. answer exactly. To, yeah. um, to this yeah, issue. Exactly. So. Yeah, I appreciate that point. Uh, to your point, Dan, I would say that if the news has taught us anything, toxic masculinity is a public health crisis exactly. as well, that's right. um, <laughs> if we've learned anything. Um, I, you, you both are, I, I want to first acknowledge how revolutionary it is that either of you are actually talking about this issue, and I appreciate your optimism. 
from the reporting end, it does not feel like things no. are getting better. Um, if anything, it feels like more and more stories are coming of administrations that are sweeping um, sexual abuse under the rug, or they don't want to deal with mm -hmm. it on their campus. Um, they think it's a personal issue, or they might even blame the victim. Um, and then I think what's happening with Betsy DeVos and Title IX is very troubling to me as well. Mm -hmm. how, are you how are you grappling with all of that? Well, I, I would say that when Secretary DeVos announced there was a rethinking um, and that um, there could be a return to a lower standard of finding of responsibility, I then sent a letter to my campus saying there won't be a return. Yeah. We have the option and we will keep the option of a higher standard, which we had actually before President uh, Obama made the, the moves he made anyway. We're gonna, we, we, we asserted essentially institutional self-governing authority to continue to have high, you know, uh, the higher standard. Um, well, the lower standard for responsibility, the higher standard of punishment, uh, or the higher uh, consequences. And so I don't know that, the, that Betsy DeVos is going to help us on this issue very much. <laughs> so, so I just don't think that's likely. So, yeah. so schools, it's on us. We are going yeah. to have to continue to work at the level of policies, messaging, partnership with students, uh, bring research to the table to show what we know and to keep learning. And that's, if it makes us uncomfortable, um, that's too bad. That's the responsibility yeah. of the leadership. Yeah. You know, there's a, Dan, I, I couldn't agree yeah. with you more. And I think that the bottom line is we have to do the right thing and we have to do what the, what the, the evidence today has, has guided us to. And, you know, underlying some of the questions about Title IX today are, is this question as to whether or not we are being fair, mm -hmm. right? That, that is really what's driving this. And I think as long as we create processes and procedures that are clear, transparent, and fair to both sides, that we cannot turn the clock back. We have got to continue to move forward. And quite frankly, as I said earlier, Title IX is just the base. This, you know, kind of dealing with these issues from the Title IX perspective is the floor. Mm -hmm. What we have to do is really work on what is the culture that leads to this. So I view it as don't turn that clock back, but let's figure out how we're gonna really move this agenda forward and do it um, pretty aggressively because as we can see, even with the execution of Title IX in far more important ways, we are still dealing with these issues. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so last question, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, I know both of you have talked a lot about um, wellness as a model um, for healthcare or for taking care of health. Can you elaborate on that a little bit, the difference between you know, the health center versus moving to a model of wellness? Mm -hmm. So in our context, after we created our college house system, we saw we made some progress. For us, the next step was to change the model of what was called, called literally the infirmary on campus, um, which was separate from uh, the counseling services. And we created a new model where we partnered with a nonprofit health, health system to create a new student center that integrated physical health, mental wellness, and mindfulness together with a lot of emphasis on group work as well as on individual work. And I don't think we've figured everything out yet, but we dramatically improved our resources. More time for, more time for, psychi for psychiatrists available to our students, um, more counselors, more communication between the, the physical health and mental wellness staff, uh, integrating now with the caregivers at home, if students get permission for that, um, all of which we weren't doing before. The driver of that, the change, which was a big one for the school, was that we wanted to focus on wellness. We hired a whole wellness coordinator who tries to engage students in partnership to work on nutrition, um, physical fitness, sleep, and sort of giving them kind of accurate, effective information about you know, things like, like opioids. Um, I don't think we're there yet, but it's more proactive and less reactive and more in partnership with students than the, than the medical model seems to imply. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, I think that we, we have moved exactly in that direction, integrating mental health, the, the traditional health service, um, and also thinking about wellness at a, very, at a much more holistic level. So for example, we are in the process of making a significant change of um, elevating the person who's going to oversee 
health and wellness to a dean level. And we'll, we're in the middle of, of creating what that description will be. Um, the idea being that this is about our education. It's not an add-on. It is an integral part of the educational experience, and it is part of what we need to enable our students to achieve in terms of the highest potential level of health and wellness. Um, resilience is one thing that I think this is a term that we use a lot. We don't yet know exactly, we know what we mean. The question is how do you produce it? And this is, I think, gonna be an essential question. The world is changing rapidly. Um, we've got many pressures in life, and our students do. How do we create that resilience? To me, that's part of the wellness. And then the last thing I'm just gonna say is also just bringing it back to the diversity of our students. Yeah. We have this enormous diversity, and we have to make sure that the more traditional health service part, so both physical and mental, with, which, which are integrated because one bleeds right into the other, um, that, they, that we have a workforce, we have providers that reflect our student population. Because without that, we're not gonna reach yeah. them. And the yeah. good news is that a lot of the stigma that had been present for so long, we're seeing that, I'm not saying it's gone, but it's fallen by the wayside mm -hmm. to a great degree, so students, want to access services, but we have to provide services that are culturally competent. Yeah. So I can't help jumping on this point just to add something, because Paula made me think about it when you said diversity. Um, so our school, Franklin and Marshall College, is known for a talent strategy by which we significantly invested in need-based financial aid, right. tripled the percentage of low-income students quickly in the student body, um, drawn from a wide range of, of, of communities and zip codes. Um, that had the effect of almost tripling the domestic student of color population. It all happened fast. And uh, as it's turned out, our newer cohorts of students are achieving at or above school levels and everything. Grades, retention rate, graduation rate, honors, scholarships, like off the charts, great, because they're so talented. But coming from lower income backgrounds and coming from uh, some communities where they're underrepresented in larger society, Families had developed all kinds of fantastic educational ways of reaching their kids and helping them strive for college and stay on track. And so we found that binge drinking and other high-risk behaviors are significantly lower among lower-income kids at Franklin and Marshall College, significantly lower, which has a positive health effect for every student because it begins to show a different story, another example, mm -hmm. another norm. Mm -hmm. And so just something to think about. You know, we get so locked into our mindset about who a college student is and what college is. Then we go out and meet driven kids from uh, modest backgrounds, taking their shot, sending a message to all of us that, you know, um, college isn't just a rite of passage for party. Mm. And, you know, nobody's more effective at sh sending that message to a 19-year-old than another 19-year-old. Yeah. yeah. Can I just end? I, I know we have to go to questions, but I just do want to say one thing, which is that you know, I cannot tell you how happy I am that we, the three of us, are here talking about this and that we have people in the yeah, audience people. who are Look interested. Yeah. Because <laughs> this is an area where I, I started out by saying we really don't have good evidence of what is, there, there's, there's some emerging, but we need to be very intentional about this. I think that we need to understand what the evidence is. We have to have a form of a collaborative to understand mm -hmm. what you're doing at Franklin and Marshall, what I'm doing at Wellesley, so that we are not recreating the wheel every time. Yeah. And that we have some infrastructure to begin to, to coordinate the data so that we can begin to say, this strategy looks hopeful, that one does yeah. not. And until we do that, you know, we, we think about doing that in other areas of pedagogy yeah. and science, this really yeah. requires it, yeah. and, and we need to take it to the next level. Possibly also making Paul Johnson Secretary of Education. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much. Um, we have time for some questions. Um, I, saw, I saw one hand in the back. It was the first hand I saw. So, <laughs> so I want to change the discussion a little bit, because I think that one of the things that is and maybe you got it to it around health, mental health. But one of the things that I find our kids are 
so oppressed by is stress. Mm -hmm. The stress of getting into college today is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. The stress to succeed is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, academically, I think you raised it, uh, Dr. Johnson. Um, how, so you see uh, bulletin boards on college campuses advocating um, yoga and um, depression therapy. And I'd love you to talk about sort of, I think this is a very different situation than it was when I was in college. Mm -hmm. The level of s just stress, which feeds into the binge drinking, but also everything else. The, the pressure we've put on our kids to get in and succeed seems like something we've never seen before. And I'd love you to address that. So I'll just begin by, you know, th there's, there are a couple of things. First of all, you're, you're talking about something critically important, and we have to start before our students get to, get to college. Yeah. Um, I will tell you, there was a study done by Boston Children's two years ago that showed that 13% of high school students have experienced clinical depression. That's just not some sadness, that's clinical depression. And the, the rates of anxiety are upwards of 70%. Now, if that's the case, what are we doing to our children? And you know, I just want to get back to this idea of emotional preparedness, which is if we begin as a culture to say, it is as important that we develop you as a human being, and for what that means for the next stage in life, developing strong relationships, Understanding how to deal with disappointment and decision making, um, facing difficult decisions and, and, and things that you're facing in your life. Um, this isn't for all students because there are students from different strata who have had to deal with these issues and have developed a certain level of resilience um, before they come. But I think this whole notion of helicopter parenting has in many ways been toxic to our young people, and then the stress, the additional stress we put on them. Now, what do we do when we get them to college? This has got to be intentional. Some yoga or some meditation yeah. is not going to be the answer to this. You know, we have got to really think, I almost call it a deprogramming. Um, and it's going to require not only this notion of what is community, but how are, how are the advisors both the student life and the faculty working with us to understand how we ratchet down the pressure. Um, and I'm going to say I don't have the answer, but what I can tell you is that this has got to be intentional because it's only adding to the treadmill. And what I'm seeing, and for all of us who've had either children in college or who were, who were in this in higher ed, these four years, if you are in a four-year college, um, are critical to, our, to a student's development. And if they continue to only check the boxes through college and don't get off the treadmill, it is truly an opportunity for education development that's wasted. And then we're not doing our job. So I, I think that this is, this is an important area and one that we need to really, again, take this very uh, directed and scientific approach and measure. You know, let's look at it and then measure how we're doing. Yeah. Well, um, that's, that's the A plus answer. And to add one, one part to it, at Franklin and Marshall, we created a faculty center so that our faculty could have a place led by an you know, expert uh, a leader in faculty development where they could develop their strategies for working with students to promote, I would just call it learning-centered classrooms. Yeah. And learning-centered classrooms don't always have to be the most work you could possibly right. cram into that classroom. I don't think we've achieved a revolution in faculty commitment, sort of like approach, because it's a very rigorous school. But we have been able to get a number of faculty to start to dial it back and be able to build more time for discussion and less testing and evaluation into what they're doing. That's one thing. And then the other thing I think is there's a, a societal work to do, I would say, to encourage students to develop two resumes. Everybody's got a resume to go get a job and to go get a head start in life. And they're, they're sort of proud of that, and that they think they're going to be judged by some standard out there based on their resume. Now, I'd like to think about a second resume that addresses um, four major questions. And those questions are, um, when did I experience joy? 
when did I experience difficulty and handle it? Um, when did I grow? And when did I help someone else? And students, if you write that resume or develop that resume and fill in those boxes, someday another line will come up. It'll be purpose. Because you'll find a lot of purpose in life from that. Yeah. And not just from going after the set of achievements that somehow make you a, you know, a super Hoya or a super diplomat or what's your, what's your mascot? We don't have one. You don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. There it is. Well, so. you know, it's just so we, I just I know we have other I just want to say one thing on that, which is that um, I'm also a firm believer, and I've seen this. Once again, I don't have the data, but my experience and the experience at the college that I've seen for in deeply engaging, not superficially, deeply engaging in service yeah. is transformational exactly. for the just the reasons that you yeah. identified yeah. in terms of thinking about those four categories. Yeah, thank you. Right here. Hi, as a college student myself, one thing I do on campus is sit on a student mental health initiative. And one of the main kind of core components of that initiative is advocating for student resources to campus administration. Mm -hmm. And this past year, my campus administration started this strategic um, resource al reallocation and really thinking at how they're spending their money, which is something a college is a business and that is something that's good to look at. But from a student perspective, one of the projects they're looking at is changing the structuring of our counseling center on campus and actually outsourcing it, which is scary for students to think about how that disproportionately affects students who might not have access to insurance. Students of color, students of low income background, some of those might more diverse backgrounds you touched on. So if you could just yeah. talk about balancing those interests, and then also as a student, how to best interact with administration who it sometimes feel is looking at how to make sure they're spending money the most efficiently. Yeah, so we, at Franklin and Marshall, when we moved to the model I described, we had to work through exactly those questions. It's critical to have in the process right up front a partnership with students serving on the committees that are looking at the decisions, that's key. But we made some mistakes in our process, and the biggest one had to do with counseling. It wasn't so much the, the quote unquote outsourcing because our employees all kept their jobs when they went to work for the new entity. That was a part of the conditions. And in fact, they got more colleagues. So we were able to have more people. But we thought there might, first of all, the question of insurance, we didn't handle quite right because some students felt that having to use their insurance, which they had, uh, to pay for any services would expose their, their, them to their parents knowing. And so, we had made a misstep. We heard students say, this isn't going to work for us. And so we changed course. And we instead provided every student, no matter what their insurance, no matter how wealthy they are, to be direct, um, eight free counseling sessions. And then they could decide if they needed something more long term, which maybe a college isn't as easily positioned to provide for them. But they, instead of having one session to diagnose and start paying, we moved it to eight. And it was a student named Allie who really did a great job bringing to the administration her thoughts and the thoughts of others in a way that was productive, but also very principled, and we listened to her. You know, Dan, there's one very important point that you made many, but there's one point I just want to pick up on, which is uh, in Massachusetts, we actually had a law passed that prevents, that enables students who were on their parents' mm. insurance to have privacy. That's amazing. And I That's think fantastic. for young people to think about that, yeah. um, there yeah. does need to be movement across the yeah. United States for that, because it is a barrier. Yeah. It's a barrier to care. And now that, you know, it's a good thing that students can stay on their parents' insurance until age 26, yeah. but the privacy issue yeah. is important. Um, and I'm very proud of that work because it, it, it does break that down. But if you have insurance from another state, yeah. it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is, so there's something for students to think about from like an organizing yeah. and a political perspective. Across the country. Yeah, that's what, what a great issue. Yeah. One over here. Um, Howard Bike from Washington, D.C. Um, so I'm going to preface my question with I, I think I'm a loving, supportive father of two recent college graduates and a college sophomore. So this question may be embedded with my own internal conflict. So now that I've prefaced it. Um, <laughs> There's been a lot of work that's been publicized, Carol Dweck at Stanford and Angela Duckworth at, at the University of Pennsylvania around grit, yeah. self-reliance. 
And Dr. Johnson, you talked about your own personal story, which is sort of emblematic of grit um, and resilience. How do you strike the balance so that we're not, um, I'm, I'm trying to put the words to it, the balance between grit and self-reliance and creating a supportive, nurturing environment on our campuses? Well, I mean, it's my strong belief that you, you can't have one without the other. You know, that you cannot think that you are going to develop self-reliance and grit in isolation um, of having the environment that allows that to be nurtured and to grow. You have to have the safety to fail, the safety to make those mistakes. I know safety has become in many arenas a bad word. I think it's a good word. I think we should reclaim it for the importance that it provides on our campuses. Um, and that's what we should be doing, creating that environment that allows those experiences. Because where, what better place than a college campus? That's a great question. Uh, and I, uh, I don't think it reflects an anxiety or anything, just a smart question. Um, I'm, I'm working on a, a manuscript about <coughs> meaning making in college campus. And one of my chapters is called The Strivers. And I look at a number of students on this question of grit and resilience and try to get them to explicate for me what, is, what did grit enable them to do. Um, in fact, one of my students, Louis Gerardo, is here. His sister, uh, Carolina, is in this. She's an incredible, incredible human being. And what I have come to see is that at least a lot of students have shared with me that that idea of grit is one quality, an important one, but it's almost always grit plus. So, for example, one student's case, Nadia, it's grit plus humility because she finally realized mm -hmm. it's okay to ask for help after having powered through obstacles her whole life. Another student, um, and I won't use her name, it was grit plus grief counseling because she was holding on to grief from her father's death when she was in seventh grade mm -hmm. in such a way that she was pounding her head up against the wall to just power through things because she was hurting so much inside. Um, and for another student, and this is Carolina, it was grit plus the freedom to step outside of the lane of medical studies and pursue rowing and art. And so, you know, I think grit's got a lot to offer it, but by itself, just, you know, how, how do we combine these great attributes, people? But have? I think it's very clear just from those three stories that Franklin and Marshall created that environment, okay? It, it might have had different forms, but it was that enabling environment. It was the safe environment yeah. in which those students could develop yeah. each that's, that's the hope, isn't aspects, it? That's why, right? that's why you're doing this. And that's why I'm it doing is. this. It's, it's yeah. wonderful. Exactly. Then thank you. Um, I don't, I, this is amazing. There are so many questions right now. <laughs> I think we have time for probably one more. Actually, I think we're, we're, we, you know, we're competing against Leslie Odom right now. He's, he's doing a yeah. concert somewhere. We're, we're, right now, we have more people listening to us than Leslie I, Odom has. <laughs> <laughs> right here, right here, and right here. Let's do that. Can we do that? And they're all questions, right? And they're quick questions, right? OK, great. <laughs> You've both mentioned a lot about resilience, and I'm curious if you guys have ever looked at HeartMath. It's a company that teaches resilience. Are you familiar with them? No. I, it's a really great resource, but okay. what programs do you have to implement to help with resilience with the children, or with the students, I should say? Uh, I, I will just say one. We, one of our supporters, um, whose name is Ken Melman, a member of my board, made a, a seven-figure donation to allow us to build a model to involve students as partners who have identif who identified themselves as resilient and gritty so that we could then, with them together, learn about the application of the grit and resilience they brought into the new setting of college. With one of our great professors, a psychology professor named Michael Penn, providing the, co the cohesion and moderating several cohorts of students as we learn together from their experience. And a big takeaway already, a really big one, has been that if a student has strength and grit and perseverance of that type coming into school, it's very valuable for them to have a mentor to help them translate mm -hmm. into the new setting. That it just doesn't, it's not just something that just happens. Mm -hmm. It's so much better to draw out of students 
uh, how that might be used at, you know, in a college setting. Hi, good evening. Um, so as a, as a recovering college, uh, college student, just recently graduated, <laughs> uh, this is something that's very important to me, um, also as a pre-med student myself. Um, but in school, it was, very, it was a very stressful yeah. time, and there were a lot of things that I wasn't well equipped to, uh, equipped to deal with, um, particularly with mental health coming from a Nigerian immigrant family, and then also coming, uh, then also being like a, um, uh, a, a male on campus, there were a lot of tendencies that were like ingrained in, into me about mm -hmm. mental health and, and mental fortitude, um, which was detrimental at first. Um, Eventually, I was able to overcome that, but my question is, is regarding like stigma uh, related to mental health on college campuses. How do we overcome that stigma? How do, can we normalize this? How can we normalize seeing like a, a, a counselor on campus? Should we have semesterly uh, mandated check-ins with a therapist? That way, all students are seeing therapists um, and it's norm normalized on campus. It's mm, a really good question. So I think that there are ways that, I mean, it's a great question, and there are ways of not only creating this sense of having to walk to the counseling center. So there are now ways that we are implementing, and it's happening on a lot of different campuses, where you, know, you can, everything from scheduling online so that you don't actually have to call and wait to programs that help you develop certain skills where you don't necessarily have to see a counselor, to training and thinking about if you're in a residential college, what is the role of peers? How can peers be helpful? You know, there's, there are peer counseling programs, there are programs in training those who are in leadership roles in various dorms, um, all of which says that this is an issue for all of us and there's a lot of work and training that goes into that. So it's not the answer, but the more we can begin to just have those conversations and have multiple opportunities and choices and touch points, the more normalized you know, it, will, it will become. Now, I, I like the, a lot the organization uh, Active Minds, which is yeah. on many campuses, yeah. that organizes all kinds of programming. And we have something called Outrunning Stigma Race that we have, like a walking, running race. And uh, there's a lot of work they do to, do, to hit that point. Um, it is such a valuable reminder that students are coming from many cultural backgrounds. And you know, immigrant students may have families that have come from traditions where no one's ever gotten counseling before because it's not part of what they do in their country. And so you know, for a student to even say they want to get it, just that alone, to even know they want it, is a step. And, and it's almost like your question brings us full circle to how we started this, this panel when you said, you know, should we even be worrying about the whole person? I think we have to worry about the whole person so that we can allow each one of us to tap our, tap our strengths and also to have the best possible academic formation. And if we don't attend to those questions, cultures, culturally responsive and thoughtful ways, as Paula said, with professionals from many walks of life, not just one background, you know, we can keep moving the ball forward. Yeah, and I just, I actually want to add to that because I think that now that you're, mm -hmm. you know, you've graduated and I, I think the stigma continues, right? Like I think that people, there's a reluctance and um, I've often noticed a generational difference where a lot of my employees are very comfortable talking about their mental health, um, what they're grappling with in the workplace. And I was really uncomfortable with it at first and now I'm like, no, this is actually how you start to change the culture and you start to destigmatize. Oh, I went to my therapist. That's like a totally normal, I mean, in Manhattan that's a totally normal thing to say, but, <laughs> but, but it's a normal thing to say. And yeah. I do think that yeah. like, you know, confiding in your friends, talking to your friends yeah. about it, and it is a huge line of coverage for us at Teen Vogue because of the stigma around it and providing resources so that, you know, when you do look up these issues, you can say like, I'm having this experience and I don't really know who to talk to about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, starting to share those resources, but really talking to your friends and creating <laughs> communities for yourself where you can openly talk about some of these issues is, I think, key. And given that you're gonna go to medical school, <laughs> this is critical. <laughs> It is so important. It's important for you as a future physician um, to have that sense of self and what it is you need to remain healthy because there are so many different pressures today that are leading to unhealthy behaviors in physicians and very high rates of depression. And a recent study that was published last year in JAMA, 
of physicians, this is a global survey, had suicidal ideation. And almost a third reported depression. So, you know, it, it's so critical as, again, our young people to work on that holistic yeah. approach because they're going to go on and they need to bring that sense to the world. Yeah. We, you know, we even, one thing we learned, and I think this is, goes across the board for all of us, how do we keep learning about all cultures? Yeah. Because the things that worked or are normal to approach a particular culture, is, is maybe for that culture still works, but there's more cultures together. I have a, kids from 50 countries on my campus. Yeah. We learned, for example, the way we were talking about um, sexual assault awareness and prevention with women students from some countries was just overwhelming. We were just f flooding them with information that was like stuff they had never talked about out loud, especially in a setting where there's all kinds of other people around they don't know. We just weren't culturally responsive. And we, we, luckily we listened and have made improvements for that. But I do think that your, your ability to stand on a bridge, in a sense, drawing upon all the strengths and practices that you, that you lived, your family lived in Nigeria, and now you're in an American context, you actually have a ton of insight and power to share mm -hmm. with others that would help more than kids from Nigeria, help kids from everywhere. All right, last question. Thank you. Um, so I'm a psychologist, and I write about issues like this for Psychology Today. Um, and it seems like with the elevated um, suicide levels, depression, anxiety, mental health issues arriving on campus, um, something new needs to happen in orientations in order to orient students to be on campus, to be in this very diverse environment, to be able to deal with conflict, to be able to deal with the difficult uh, things that happen, including speakers that they disagree with, ideas that they find unpleasant. or um, But it also seems like the help that, that they need more help in uh, dealing with these things without being emotionally reactive, but instead of getting that help, there seems to be more encouragement on the part of a lot of administrations and faculty to feel more harmed, to you know, take words as injury, even talking about words as violence. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it seems to me like this is pretty bad for kids' mental health when they really need to be learning to um, grapple more competently with more resilience, they're being treated like they're more fragile. Um, what do you think we can do to, to reverse that course? I know Wellesley has had some pretty significant issues in this realm, um, you know, with speakers coming to campus who are disfavored and uh, faculty. Well, I, just want, I just want to clarify, at Wellesley, we have not had any shouting down or closing down of speakers. No, that's true. They were okay, so we had actually, I'm very proud of what happened at Wellesley, in fact. What we had was, controversial speakers and the one that made it into the news the most, the students organized and did a very respectful talk back. Well, I was um, thinking more in terms of the professors. The professors who treated the students like they, you know, the letter that the professors wrote talked about words as causing injury and causing harm. That's yeah. the concern that I have. The, the students can only be expected to do what the students do. Yeah. I think it's a complicated question. And, you know, because I'm, I'm not going to, getting into the whole freedom of speech issue, I think, is beyond the scope of, of our talk. <laughs> but I think that we have to, one, I think we all embrace the First Amendment and we embrace the need to um, engage our students with difference and ideas and critical thinking, all the things, all the buzzwords that we are using. But at the bottom of this is um, we do have to create a much clearer sense of inclusion and also how we are bringing, actively bringing our students to the table to have various types of discussion as an educational experience. So, you know, it's complicated. I mean, at Wellesley, we've started, um, we've initiated this past semester um, a very significant uh, initiative. It's a task force on speech and inclusion, which is gonna, it's made up of four students, four faculty, and four staff to come back with recommendations on how we create 
much more, uh, much greater sense of, a much greater sense of inclusion um, while also fostering this dynamic um, way of interacting and sharing ideas and, and engaging in difference. And faculty are as much a part of that as students as a much a part of that as staff. So this is, these are big issues for our campuses and every constituent has got to be engaged. I, I would just add one little thing, which is a little point, but it's worth mentioning because you called orientation. I actually think, in a way, orientation may be one of the more overrated concepts because everything is so important. You need time. I think orientation should go on exactly. for all four years. We walk across the stage, congratulations, you're oriented to being a college graduate. Um, but I still could use a little orientation because the issues well, all change. You're, you're yeah. totally, you know, Dan, we are actually, this year, in, the, in August, we are actually taking a lot out of orientation. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's only but so much exactly. a student who's getting used to a new place, new yeah. people, yeah. can absorb. Exactly. That's smart. And it's too much. It needs to be um, really spread throughout. It's much more of a continuous yeah. process. It's the way we learn. Why would it be different than anything else? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. This was an amazing conversation. Um, thank you, everybody, tonight. And let's have another round of applause for our amazing, thank you, team panelists.